Uh, welcome to uh, today's event. Um, my name is Jesse Patterson. I am a senior director of business development here at CQDM. Um, and I'd like to welcome you all to today's webinar from candidates to drugs, applications of AI in translational research. Uh, this is the third um, of a series of, of webinars on the evolving landscape of AI implementation in new drug discovery and development. A um, couple quick housekeeping points. Um, first, if you have questions uh, for consideration during today's panel discussion, uh, please use the, uh, you know, submit them via, via the, the, the Zoom functions below. Um, I do want to emphasize that during the registration process that we invited you to uh, submit questions. And so we already have a number of questions that have already been submitted. And so uh, we're not sure we'll be able to get to everybody's uh, questions. So if you do submit a question and it doesn't get answered, we apologize. But I guess uh, please understand that there are other questions that were already submitted. Uh, second, uh, for those of you that are interested, there is a translation uh, that is available during the uh, today's webinar. Uh, to access it, uh, you need to click on the little, little planet icon um, in the meeting controls. For ceux entre vous qui sont intéressés, une traduction est disponible pendant la webinar d'aujourd'hui. Pour accéder, uh, vous devez cliquer sur la petite icône icon de la planète dans les contrôles de la réunion. Um, so, for those of you that don't know CQDM, I uh, just wanted to take a couple of uh, minutes here to just uh, discuss CQDM and, and what we do and, and kind of this, uh, this series of webinars. So um, we're a Canadian biopharmaceutical research consortium. Um, we have a unique model uh, that funds multi-stakeholder, business-led, purpose-driven, collaborative R&D um, aimed at accelerating the translation and development of novel um, vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics uh, to address unmet uh, needs. Um, we are, our, our business-led biopharma-oriented research consortium model uh, provides financial leverage to de-risk uh, early stage cutting edge technologies. Um, since our inception in 2008, uh, we've probably funded, well, we funded over 110 projects. Um, and what I'd like to, we've noticed that, you know, over the last couple of years with the increased uh, use of AI and biopharma, um, you know, likewise, we've seen an increase in the number of, of AI uh, or projects that are funded that include AI for, you know, the purposes of biopharma research. Um, and so, you know, this is one of the reasons that, you know, we're proud to present, um, you know, this series of webinars, um, you know, where we can explore kind of how AI can be used and how it is being used, but also how it will be used. Um, and, you know, hopefully provide a bit of a forum to discuss and to hear about, you know, this rapidly expanding field, because I think, you know, we've still only touched the, you know, the tip of the iceberg of the use of AI in biopharma research. So it's really exciting to see kind of what's cutting edge in terms of now, but also where it's going in the future. Um, also, we're delighted uh, for to have Philip DeGarry again with us today. Uh, he'll be the moderator for this webinar. Phillips, um, again, thank you for working with us on, on this whole series of webinars. Um, and I look forward to hearing the uh, presentations from you and the rest of the panelists. So over to you, Philip. Excellent. So thank you so much uh, for the introduction, Jesse. Um, for those of you who um, had not joined our previous webinars, um, this is the third in a series which uh, uh, address what we think of as the grand challenges for the discovery of new medicines. Um, the first being trying to decide what to work on. So what targets, what biology, what disease indications, what pathophysiology, um, which is really existential and fundamental to the industry. Uh, and we had an excellent um, session on that related to the use of publicly available data particularly multi-omic data, but also biomedical literature uh, and a variety of other data sources. Um, the second kind of grand uh, question uh, is the identification of an appropriate therapeutic entity, a drug-like molecule or a cell therapy, uh, and how we can use deep learning and artificial intelligence to get very quickly um, to the most promising set of molecules. Uh, and we had, again, an excellent uh, set of presentations, uh, typically focused on chemistry, but um, excellent use of uh, deep learning and uh, AI uh, in the development of a regenerative cell therapy. Um, and today, as the last in this series, we are going to uh, take on 
what is perhaps um, the biggest challenge of all um, in the industry, uh, a source of significant failure, uh, a source of significant disappointment to patients who need uh, therapeutic options, um, which is the ability to take uh, therapeutic entities, uh, drugs, uh, cell therapies, uh, digital therapies, uh, and translate them into meaningful medicines that have a clinical effect. Uh, the failure rate in the industry uh, is still quite astonishing, over 60% at this transitional point. Uh, it's an enormous economic impact, but most importantly, uh, uh, it is disappointing for patients who so badly need new therapies. And so today we're going to take that challenge uh, on directly uh, and talk about how we can deploy deep learning and artificial intelligence uh, to more efficiently translate um, preclinical discoveries into early clinical uh, trials in a very effective, meaningful and predictive way. And with that, uh, I'd like to introduce um, our first speaker. We're privileged to, to be joined today by um, Professor Dina Katabi. Um, she's the Swan and Nicole Pham Professor of Electrical uh, Engineering and Computer Science at MIT. Uh, she's an MIT uh, alumna, so receiving her, both her PhD and master's degree from MIT, uh, and she has her Bachelor of Science from Damascus University. Uh, I first saw Dina present uh, a couple of years ago um, at our Science Day uh, in Cambridge, um, where she, she showed some uh, really revolutionary thinking um, on how to collect vast amounts of interesting data um, in a very passive and, and gentle way uh, from patients with neurodegenerative disorders. And she'll talk, I think, a little bit about that today. Um, and so uh, without further ado, um, we'll hand over to Dina for her presentation. Thanks, Philip. So I'm gonna share my slides. Uh... Okay, so uh, just was a nod uh, from you, Philip. I was just, uh, you see the slides, correct? Yes. Okay, nice. Okay, so hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here to tell you about uh, some of the recent advances in AI and digital technologies, but particularly advances, advances that focus on clinical trials, uh, developing new endpoints and biomarkers. So uh, we, as Philip mentioned, clinical trials are very important and particularly like uh, we are looking for improving the uh, outcome, reducing the cost of clinical trials so to avoid uh, failures in late stages to avoid these uh, particularly costly failures. So, and for, to, for doing this, many of uh, the pharmaceutical and pharma companies uh, are pushing the clinical trials to the home, talking about distributed trials, trying to collect as much data in the home from digital technology. One of the biggest challenges once you do this is that you are going to face adherence problems and engagement problems. And the question that we ask is, can we really develop these distributed clinical trials and with minimal cost while maximizing the amount of data and the meaningful data that we can get from those clinical trials and avoiding adherence engagement problems? So to do that, uh, we in my group at MIT uh, have been working for almost a decade now on uh, this new technology, and now we have it operational in clinical trials. So basically, imagine if you can have a smart Wi-Fi-like box that sits in the home, but it's much smarter than your average Wi-Fi box. It can analyze the electromagnetic waves in the environment that bounce off our bodies, and from that, it can get breathing, sleep, heartbeats, uh, sleep apnea, gait, mobility, even nocturnal scratching, and all of that stuff passively without asking people to wear any sensors. So we call this smart Wi-Fi box, the Emerald box. And as I said, it is really enabled with these noble neural networks that analyze the wireless signal that bounce off people's bodies. 
So let me show you a few uh, examples. So here you can see a home, the wireless signal spread inside the home. They uh, bounce off our bodies because our bodies are full of water. And some of these signals will come back to our device. In this case, I would detect a fall and can add it into the clinical record of the patient in case if a clinical uh, practice, it will alert the provider and the, uh, uh, the um, uh, caregiver. So uh, let me show you a few examples with uh, people and so that you can appreciate what we can do. So here you see one of my students and what you can see is one of our offices at MIT. You see this big arrow here. So our device is not even in the same office with this person. We are gonna monitor him through the wall by leveraging the fact that every movement that he takes changes the electromagnetic waves around him. The thread dot here that you see is where the device thinks that he's standing right now. So let me play this video for you. So as he moves, you can see that the red dot is moving with him. He doesn't have any wearables on himself. It's completely passive just because when he moves, it changes the electromagnetic waves around him. And the device is capturing that through a wall. Now, of course, everything that we do we compare to the gold standard when you are talking about motion, you are talking about something called the Vicon motion capture room, and we can show that our tracking of motion is highly accurate and comparable to the gold standard, but of course, completely passively. Now, if you are able to track people and their gait and their mobility, but also track their location inside the home, then not only you get gait and motion and motor symptoms, but also you get behavioral symptoms. You can tell like how, how often the person goes to the bathroom, to the kitchen, what is their eating behavior? What is their toileting behavior? Uh, are they uh, anxious? They are doing repetitive movements, all of that stuff. We can also monitor sleep. When people go to sleep, our brain waves change and we enter different stages, awake, light sleep, deep sleep, and rapid eye movements. And of course, these sleep stages are related to sleep disorders, but they are also a platform for a variety of diseases. Just to give you an example, like in mood disorders, for example, in depression, rapid eye movements tend to happen early in the sleep. If you are talking about diseases like Alzheimer and Parkinson, of course, sleep is a problem, but particularly, for example, Alzheimer's, the slow waves during deep sleep are affected. So today, if you want sleep stages, you send your patient to a sleep lab like this person here. They put these electrodes on his head and body and they ask him to sleep like this. So you might get like a few nights if for your study, for your clinical trial. On one hand, it is very limited number of nights. On the other hand, of course, this is not the most comfortable and representative way of their sleep. Now, let me show you what we can do. So here is our device transmit very low power wireless signal, analyzes the reflection using AI. And from that, it can get the sleep stages. What you see on the screen is what is called a hypnogram, which is for every 30 seconds of sleep, it tells you whether the person is in awake, REM, light sleep, deep sleep. And of course, as I said, we compare always with the gold standard showing that our method is accurate and reliable. This is a person sitting like you guys, and what you see on the screen is his inhales and exhales. We don't have any wearables on him. We ask him to hold his breath. You see that the signal is at a steady level because he exhaled, he did not inhale. And again, in this case, we compare to the gold standard, which is a chest belt worn on the person uh, body and the accuracy of the exact details of the sleep signal matches what you get from uh, this FDA approved device. Now, this is a new endpoint. It is for nocturnal scratching. So what, you are, what we are monitoring here is scratching. So we see when the, the classifier, when the person is not moving, it says movement. When it's scratching, it says scratching. When he stops scratching and moves back his hand, it says movement. And then when he's not doing anything, it says no scratching. So this is today, if you are looking at a topic dermatitis, for example, or chronic itch, the way you, you try your endpoint work is by asking the patient to assess the severity of their disease 
but here we can measure nocturnal scratching in an objective way. And the accuracy, as you can see, there are very few false positive, false negative. We have very high recall and precision. Over the last three years, we have been working with pharmaceutical company and biotech companies in variety of diseases. Uh, with uh, including like uh, neuroscience, like Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, rare diseases, uh, immuno, uh, autoimmune diseases, uh, and uh, atopic dermatitis, uh, immune diseases like Crohn's, etc. So I want to show you uh, just two examples from actual clinical studies. So here, what you see first, I mean, I just want to show you the sensor. This is our device just uses a wireless signal in the environment, completely passive, sits in the background of the home. The patients don't have to do anything. There are no uh, real need for engagement or adherence issues. So let me talk first about Parkinson's. So Parkinson's, of course, is uh, a slow, uh, it's a degenerative disease. One of the major problems with Parkinson is the lack of progression uh, biomarkers that are effective that can measure changes in the disease over a short period of time because the disease changes very slowly. So what we looked at is can we actually assess Parkinson's disease at the, in the home? So we, we use a relatively small study of 50 participants. Uh, two thirds are par have Parkinson's, one third are control, and we monitor them for one year. And we looked at their movement, just passive movement in the home, and we collect hundreds of thousands of gate speed measurements over that time, completely passively. The first question that we asked, is this measurement actually grounded in the, in the way today we assess Parkinson's disease, which is the MDSUPDRS? So what I'm plotting for you here on the x-axis, the MDSUPDRS, which is the gold standard for assessing the severity of Parkinson's to, uh, today. And on the y-axis, the unscripted passive gait measurement of each individual, each dot here is one individual in the study. And you can see very highly correlated uh, that, that our study, passive study of gait at home is very highly correlated with the mds -UPDRS. Now, what you see on the x-axis is something called mds -UPDRS part three, which focuses on motor symptoms, but you can take the whole mds -UPDRS, which has four parts and motor and non-motor symptoms. And as you can see, the correlation, the very high correlation persists with a small p-value indicating that passively now in the home of the patient, we are able to track severity of their disease. Now, interestingly, if you take the mds -UPDRS, although it is the gold standard, it actually has so much noise that if you are having just a clinical study with 50 patients for one year, you are not going to see statistical significance in the change in the mds -UPDRS. So your clinical study would fail because just the mds -UPDRS has so much noise that this is not enough. So can we solve this problem? So I'm going to show you the change, the decline in gait in the patient versus the control. And this is just one patient versus one control. And you can see the decline in the Parkinson patient is almost a twice as much their gait decline over one year. But this is just two individuals. This is not statistically significant, of course. So let's look now at the whole cohort. And the whole cohort, so you see in blue, the control, in red, the Parkinson patients. And actually, even with such a small study, 50 patients, 50 participants over one year, we can show statistical significance in change in the status of the patients. Uh, atopic dermatitis, of course, is a very important hot area of research now and development for pharmaceutical companies. Typically, as we said, if you are looking for endpoint in atopic dermatitis or chronic itch, you are looking for something really subjective. You ask the patient to rank on a scale from zero to 10, whether their itch is severe or not, where 10 is the maximum severity. So over the last decade, the whole industry has been trying to find a more objective endpoint. And one way to do it is to put cameras in patients' homes and look at them when they are asleep and try to then have people watching these videos. And for every time they scratch, you say, oh, they scratch. Now, what we can do is we can replace this whole thing with just a wireless device 
do not invade the uh, do not invade the privacy of the patient and just automate the whole process. And let me show you the accuracy. So here, what you see on the x axis is the human annotation of scratching. On the y axis is the Emerald AI method using wireless signal. We have sixteen patients and uh, two seventy nights. And as you can see, very high accuracy. The correlation is 95%. The p-value is small. You can plot AUC and sensitivity and specificity. They are both very high. So with this, let me end by saying that AI and digital technology can actually bring major changes to clinical trial in, uh, for pharmaceutical and biotech companies, and hopefully can dramatically reduce the cost and improve the outcomes of clinical trials. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dina, for a really um, interesting and insightful presentation. Um, just to remind the uh, audience, um, you know, please uh, submit questions through either the chat or the Q and A um, uh, box at the bottom of the uh, Zoom panel. And and thanks to Agnes Klein for the first question. We'll deal with the questions uh, during the panel session. Um, and we'll give precedence to uh, pre-submitted questions. Our next presenter uh, is Tim Smith. Um, Tim is the Director of Data and Analytics at Takeda, uh, leads the MIT Takeda program and is very familiar with, um, uh, with Dina's work. And uh, additionally, he co-created Takeda's uh, Shiner AI Center for Artificial Intelligence. Uh, Takeda being, I think, one of the industry leaders uh, in the application of deep learning and artificial intelligence to uh, drug discovery and translational science. Um, so I'll hand it over to uh, Tim. Thank you. And uh, I'm supposed to make sure I got my clicker working here. Oops, looks like it stopped. All right, so thank you. And uh, yeah, great talk, uh, Dina. Tough act to follow in a way. Um, so uh, my role right now at Takeda is, is deeply steeped in AI ML and how we're applying it uh, throughout the entire drug development pipeline. And I wanna just, um, as it was mentioned by Philip, the, the Shindai Center is our new center of excellence. It's just about a year old now. And I just wanted to point out, not to go into too much detail, but this was founded on this idea of, there were a lot of programs popping up and some of the leadership was like, how do we know what we're building is robust? Is it trustable? How do we understand all of this? So we thought we'd build this center of gravity. The Japanese word for trust is Shindai. So that's how it got the name. And we have three elements that we put together here. One is um, an education programs for people from the general audience of the company through collaborators who work on projects, but don't necessarily produce the models up to what we call practitioner levels, where we're pushing our even our most advanced um, data scientists to improve their skills and, and continue to move with this rapidly evolving field. The evaluate component of this is something that I led, which is building a framework by which each of our programs has to go through and really dig in and figure out, you know, is their problem machine learnable? Uh, what kind of algorithms are they applying? Are they doing it correctly? Um, and then also challenging them in areas of, of how do you detect bias? How do you make your model interpretable if that's important? And then in the end, it goes into a, a risk assessment. And this is core. It's sort of like it, the fundamental question is, hey, if your algorithm's wrong, what could happen? And it, it applies to the patient level, to the company level, as well as the societal level. So that's kind of core to how we're, we're thinking and, and building really truly robust and trustable algorithms at, at Takeda. And so and I'm going to go into an example. Um, and I think this one is nice because it ties in with uh, safety as well as um, efficacy. And let's see, you probably wonder why there's a panda and a koala on here. These are the acronyms for two machine learning algorithms that we're building right now. Well, um, one called pandas and the other one's koalas. 
And what it's around is we have a compound, eclusig or panatinib, that is for treating CML. And it is a potent compound, but it also has shown to have some side effects with uh, vascular occlusive events. And so what we did with Pando is we made a machine learning algorithm that could take patient data and then do predictions uh, to see whether they were likely to suffer from one of these VOCs. And the other component of that in is like that we've built this interesting math model around um, optimized dosing of panatinib uh, once patients reach a certain level of immune response. And so it optimizes to help develop for uh, each individual, what is the right dose, the lowest dose that's possible for um, panatinib. So together, we're working now all the way, we worked into the translational space and now even towards commercial, where we're trying to realize this goal of a true digital companion. A, so we have a compound that is in the clinic and now also in, in use, but we want to have a companion that goes with it that actually helps pull data together and help clinicians to make even uh, better decisions uh, for the health and safety of the patients. So, as it was mentioned before, I've been given the lead of the MIT Takeda program, and Dina's familiar with this, and I'm showing here round one, but this is a, a really interesting program with Takeda that we challenge internally uh, people to find important business problems uh, within the company, and then we present these to faculty at MIT, and they work to decide which ones they'd like to, to work on. And then they're funded for two years to generate new algorithms that then and new learning that can come back to Takeda. And as you can see here, this is just round one. We have projects touching every element of the uh, pipeline. Round two, uh, I won't show you that slide, but it also has even more projects now, it has 10. But um, we have areas where we're looking at, we'll talk for a few minutes about microbiome work that we're doing. Um, that's in sort of target discovery, but also safety. Um, we're using deep learning for liver image analysis, uh, finding IBD patients. We're also um, having a large impact on the, um, on the manufacturing process, being able to uh, inspect vials, inspect the product as it's being developed and, and making it so that there's less reliance on on humans and, and having a higher yield and a safer product. And then as we go out down, you know, post-marketing and safety also, we have work we're doing in NLP space for lo looking for adverse effects, um, automating the scientific literature view at a number of levels. And, and even some of the later things we're working on are quite interesting in the space of looking for a signal detection. And so, I want to go then into a couple of examples, and these are going to be from this program, and just to sort of highlight the interesting ways that we are using uh, AIML already in the process of our drug discovery. And this next one is a project in neuroscience, which is trying to address and, and use biomarkers for, to develop biomarkers for clinical research in the area of frontotemporal dementia. And what's really fascinating about this work and I, is that you can actually, to think that you can take a voice to peer into inside someone's brain to, to understand its status of brain health. And so what they're doing here, uh, FTD is, is, you can, is, is kind of complicated. It has uh, different types of, of manifestations but using both the tone of the voice and the, and the actual words that are being uh, produced by a patient, we can, using this uh, deep learning technique where you convert the voice actually into an image and you analyze the image, we're able to see clearly that there are elements of the way people speak that give a, a clear sense of, of the health of their, of their brain or, their, or the type of FTD that they might be developing. This is really important and, and exciting because I, I know like uh, what Dina showed earlier, this sort of passive way of, of getting information. Uh, so to have someone be able to speak you're in a, and be able to understand their brain health 
it's quite remarkable to think you could at a distance um, really kind of get a picture of how someone is, is, is progressing with their disease or in the case of once we get into trials, if our therapeutics are actually uh, reversing or, or at least holding the disease a, as it is. This is a, so the FTD work, that's one element. And then I'll share one more project with you that is, I think, kind of truly remarkable. And, and this covers a lot of, of potential. This is, a, this is earlier work, but um, it's work that's been done in the round one of our MIT project. And it's around microbiome. And I think a lot of people are, have heard about microbiome. Uh, it, just for those that aren't so familiar, um, within our gut and on our skin and every, all over us, there's an entire uh, microbiotic world living. Like in fact, there's 10 times more cells within our, our GI than there are in our entire body. And there's a lot of different types. So what that really means is there's a lot of genetic dark matter right now. We don't know what these proteins are and what they're doing, but we do know that there are really strong effects of the microbiome on human health. And it, that there's a relationship there between our immune health, uh, for example, and also um, mental health. And I'll give you one example that is quite fascinating. In mice, uh, it was shown that if they take uh, microbiome from a, a normal healthy human and they put it into uh, these mouse models that are um, for uh, autism spectrum disorder studies that by transferring that microbiome alone that a lot of the symptoms of autism begin to disappear and further work show that 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 cutting the vagal nerve then you can also then get that autism spectrum disorder back. So what, it, what that really means is that there is a two-way discussion going on between the human brain and the human gut that is elemental to our, our mental health. So just that alone is quite an interesting idea. And so what we're doing here with the microbiome work is, is just trying to get a handle of what's there and begin to decode it. And uh, researchers at MIT did something very interesting they use natural language processing to analyze the sequence of these uh, millions of different targets, uh, target proteins, and they're able to begin to decipher what these different proteins are potentially doing. Why this is important too is it's not just about overall general microbiome, but it, this is also a source of new targets as well as potentially new ligands. And furthermore, the safety of our drugs is also dependent on the microbiome, how they get metabolized, uh, as well as the health of the gut and how they're absorbed. So it's a very interesting space. I'm very excited to be a part of that. And so with that, I believe I've used my 10 minutes and uh, look forward to questions afterwards. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you, Tim, for what is a really um, nice overview of how um, deep learning and artificial intelligence is being deployed, you know, really end to end um, in the biopharmaceutical industry, um, but really nice examples um, that are very relevant, you know, to translational science. Um, our next uh, speaker is Christian Dansavo, um, who is the founder and CEO of Perceive AI. Uh, Christian uh, is again another um, electrical and biomedical engineer, uh, getting degrees from McGill, as well as uh, his PhD in computer science from Université de Montréal, um, and spent some time uh, at the Montreal Institute of Learning Algorithms, MILA, one of the premier uh, artificial intelligence uh, centers on Earth, and he's going to talk to you um, about Perceive AI today. Thank you very much, Philip. Um, just gonna wait for the slides to come up. Uh, all right. So per CVI, we are a precision medicine company. Uh, we do forecast of, of uh, progression of disease. So as you all know, clinical trials have a poor success rate. Um, we invest a lot in preclinical settings to bring up new potential candidate therapies, and we need to maximize our chances of success uh, once we are evaluating these drugs uh, in clinical trials. Unfortunately, um, 
All right. Um, so Alzheimer's is a good example of that. Those trials are extremely long, five years plus. Uh, they are expensive, especially in late phase clinical trials, and they have one of the worst um, success rate uh, in the whole clinical trial industry. Um, so our, the, the main question that we need to ask ourselves is, are we evaluating these drugs or these therapies on the right patients? Uh, meaning that uh, these individuals need to progress or have the specific event, if not treated, during the time window of the clinical trial. And unfortunately, this is not necessarily the case, uh, especially in Alzheimer's disease, but in also a lot of other neurological and cardiovascular disease. So we recruit a lot of individuals that will remain stable for the duration of the trial. That doesn't mean that they don't have the disease, it's just that they are in a plateau or a stable phase. And uh, that increased the heterogeneity of the population that is recruited, leading for a uh, clinical trial is to uh, need to compensate for that. And they will have larger trials and longer trials to try to compensate for that. Moreover, um, we, can, we run into the risk of introducing new bias. So the fact that we are not accounting for uh, these different um, disease trajectory leads to potential uh, disproportionate amount of individuals, let's say of non-decliners in one group, in the treatment group or in the placebo group that could uh, influence basically the interpretation of efficacy of uh, the drug. And finally, um, having these heterogeneous trajectory uh, inside the clinical trial mean that you will also potentially reduce the power of your study. So you were aiming for 80% power, but in reality, most of these clinical trials uh, are underpowered and uh, lies more around 45% to 65% power. So one of the leading cause of that is disease progression variability. Essentially, two individuals with similar profile uh, and similar symptoms will progress very differently from one subject to the other. Some of them will remain stable or will be in the plateau phase. Uh, others may progress at various rate of, uh, of decline. And that increase uh, a lot of the uncertainty uh, when you're uh, a clinician trying to diagnose the disease in uh, the early phases of the disease where the, it's the optimal treatment window. Uh, and also in clinical trial, when you recruit individuals in your trial, you will end up uh, not necessarily accounting for these various trajectory of patients and therefore um, have a very heterogeneous population uh, in terms of their prognostic. So our solution is a machine learning prognostic platform to forecast disease progression. We essentially combine multimodal data uh, to really have an holistic view of the patient. So uh, brain MRI, blood work, genomic, and clinical data to really have, um, to, to capture multiple uh, angles, basically, of the disease. Since most of these diseases are very multifactorial in nature, it's important to look at them from uh, multiple standpoints. All of that information is fed into our prognostic platform that in turn provide a disease progression forecast. That forecast has the potential to de-risk clinical trials, shorten time to diagnosis, and ultimately improve patient outcome. So here I'm gonna show you some specific results on one of our product called Foresight AD. It's a forecasting tool for cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease uh, and specific impact on clinical trials. So the problem here is heterogeneity of clinical trials, uh, of uh, cognitive trajectory, sorry, in Alzheimer's disease. Um, most uh, current clinical trials in Alzheimer's disease uh, have a very uh, have a lot of difficulty showing differences between the, the placebo group and the treatment arm, and uh, most of them actually uh, don't even show any uh, decline on the placebo group in the time interval of the clinical trial, which is about 18 months to 24 months. And that suggests that the crude inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria that we are currently using don't capture enough of that information to make a proper recruitment process. Essentially, the main problem is that we are recruiting uh, a variety of individuals with different trajectories. Some of them remain stable, others uh, decline much faster. And that obviously has impact on the power of the study and your chances of success of demonstrating that your drug is effective. So combining uh, MRI, cognitive test, demographic information, and potentially uh, APOE4 genotyping, 
uh, you can capture a, a more precise um, picture of the patient. All these uh, modalities are normally acquired during clinical trial, but they are usually uh, looked at uh, on an individual modality basis instead of looking at them as a system or as a, uh, combining their, their different piece of information. So here, what we are trying to achieve is to pinpoint the individuals that will remain stable for the duration of the trial and the ones that have, uh, are more likely to progress. And that will inform uh, your ability to select the right individuals for the trial and uh, during the trial as well to bring up uh, more information. So here I'm showing you a study that we've done on early Alzheimer's disease patients. This is <clears throat> mild cognitive impairment individual and um, early dementia individuals. That study was done on 1,342 patients. About 30% of the whole population did not decline during the duration of the trial, so the 24 months of follow-up. Um, what I'm showing you on these graphs on the y-axis, this is cognitive decline from baseline, and the time is on the x-axis. The black line represents your average population that you would typically uh, select in your clinical trial. And the blue and the orange line represent our prediction from baseline, so from the first time point, what we, the subjects that we deemed uh, stable and the ones that we deemed as uh, likely decliners. And as you can see, the, when you follow them up, uh, they really have a different trajectory. Uh, essentially, the blue ones that are the likely uh, stable individuals and the orange ones, the likely decliners. And that has been replicated across multiple data sets, among which one is a phase three clinical trials. So we've also looked at the impact of, uh, of such a selection if we were to take only the orange individuals and exclude the ones uh, that are stable. Um, and we've conducted power analysis to, to look at that, trying to identify 30%, how many subjects do we need to uh, detect the 30% treatment effect at an 80% uh, power. And that would require about 400 participants per arm uh, with the standard selection. And with our enriched population selection, we would uh, only require 200 participants per arm, which is a reduction, a massive reduction of 50%. Um, while maintaining the exact same power as your initial uh, study. So that's a reflection basically of the quality of the selection. You can uh, do multiple things with that information. The first thing is that you can increase the quality of the population selected, meaning that you can increase the power of your study detecting smaller effects. The second thing is that you, with a higher, uh, better quality population, you can reduce the sample size achieving basically the same power with fewer patients of higher quality. You can also intervene during a clinical trial. Um, so assessing if uh, there is imbalance between the, the treatment group and the placebo arm in terms of the, the people that have, um, have a prognostic or uh, of stability or of likely decliners that would potentially impact your uh, final analysis. And you can bake that into your final statistical analysis so to correct for these uh, kind of potentially uh, harmful interpretation. And finally, you can use it to re-stratify failed clinical trials to salvage them, trying to identify a subpopulation of individuals at, at higher risk so that you can show um, uh, steeper effects uh, of your drug. So we are developing products in neuro and in cardiovascular disease. Um, I wanted to point out uh, a few points uh, specifically about bringing these uh, AI tools uh, into the clinical trial realm and also into the clinical realm. It's very important that we build trust. Uh, a few points or highlights that I would like to bring up is the importance of generalizability of these predictive models. We need to validate these tools across multiple data sets and show robustness of these tools, also in very large cohort, ideally and a uh, diverse one. Uh, this is a challenging uh, topic to have diverse population. I think we're getting there more and more, but it's still, uh, we're not there yet. Um, the other point uh, which uh, Tim brought up is explainability of AI as well. So being able to explain the rationale or which features were um, used or weighted towards the specific decision or recommendation. And finally, uh, deploy these tools and these AI models uh, into a secure and privacy-preserving uh, manner is quite important. 
So this is it for me. Um, just to, to make a, a final point is that uh, prognostic information is extremely important to uh, de-risk our development of new therapies and to enable 10-year diagnosis. So please do reach out. My uh, email is at the bottom left of the, the corner and uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Christian. And it's fantastic. Um, you know, to see finally some progress uh, in understanding um, and, you know, potentially developing new medicines for Alzheimer's disease, uh, an enormous social burden for which uh, there are really uh, still um, almost no meaningful therapeutic options. So that's very, very encouraging. Uh, and then we're going to wrap up the um, presentation section. Um, with Richard Law, who is the uh, Chief Business Office of Excientia, um, one of the, I would say, highest profile um, new uh, companies that are using uh, deep learning and artificial intelligence um, for the, all stages of the drug discovery project. Um, Richard uh, got his PhD in biochemistry and molecular biophysics uh, at the University of Oxford, um, and then uh, worked for a number of years at Evatech. Uh, as the head of computational chemistry. Uh, and he's going to talk to us today about the uh, exciting uh, developments um, in one of the fastest growing uh, machine learning companies in our space, Richard. Thanks a lot, Phil, and uh, thanks to the team for inviting me to speak today. So hopefully I can just very quickly give you a flavor of the kinds of things we're doing at Excientia to drive drug design in uh, a patient uh, precision medicine way, which we call patient first AI. So we're really proud at Accenture that we have the first three molecules that have made it into the clinic that were truly designed entirely by AI, two of which were in CNS with a partner and one in oncology in a, a that is a wholly owned um, asset. Um, we also have a uh, patient tissue platform that is the first to be shown to have real progression-free survival clinical outcomes in oncology. And we're using that in the design of our uh, new cancer drug molecules. And I'll explain a little bit how that works in a second. Um, but we're working on something like 30 something projects. Um, we have multiple candidates in many therapeutic areas. And it's really the, the AI, despite the fact that we're driving towards better drugs, has uh, unprecedented productivity uh, when we compare it to, to, to how things normally occur in the industry. So it's really important we, we think of drug discovery as a learning problem. So it's important to separate out the concept, that concept of learning from the idea that you can design a drug either by high throughput screening or just the use of big data. So the algorithms that we use enable fast learning into a problem because by definition, Every drug discovery program starts with actually very little specific information. It's not like learning, it's not like teaching a computer to drive a car, which happens all the time. It's it, the computer has to actually figure out in multi parameter space how is it going to solve all the problems that need to be solved for a drug to be a drug. And there are thousands of reasons why a molecule might not be a drug if you don't solve those problems. The platform is completely data and of course, therapeutic area agnostic from use of structures, use of phenotypic data, use of videos of mice in boxes. Um, and we firmly believe that the patient is the best model. I mean, it's really important that the, all of the data is of the highest quality possible. And of course, the most powerful data that we can give the AI in its design is data that can come from a patient. So just quickly, the company, we, we talk of ourselves as a pharma tech company. It's important to understand that 
Half of the company are the tech side, that is the, the data scientists, the programmers building up and maintaining the platform. But half of the people are experienced medicinal chemists and biologists helping to give that AI the right data to, under, to help it to, in its design process and understand the, the problem. So um, we've arrived at seven uh, candidate drugs so far, and they were designed, so from beginning to design to candidate selection in around about 12 months across a range of different target classes and types from, from novel to somewhat known. Um, and indeed the number of compounds that we tested, uh, designed uh, and in that those programs was relatively small compared to industry as well. So we're typically um, testing 15 to 25 compounds in each design cycle. Um, but we keep a very wide screening cascade uh, in order to test molecules in as many assays as possible in order to give as much data as possible um, to the algorithm. And this is kind of a busy slide, but it tries to explain firstly that the patient and data from the patient is really important to us, but that we don't think of drug discovery as a linear process. Also, what I try to say here is that we're using AI in multiple phases of the drug discovery process. So we have a biology AI knowledge graph platform that enables us to link 31 million publications together to understand uh, semantic links between targets and potential therapeutic outcomes. Uh, we have a patent around that. And one of the interesting things is you can see from that that sometimes links uh, between targets and therapeutic areas can be made but not explicitly stated, sometimes 20 years ahead of when they, that explicit link is created. So that can really give you a leg up in terms of, okay, which targets should we try to validate to go after? The engine of Accenture is the center of this, the DMTA cycle, the chemistry AI that's really driving uh, from target to candidate. Uh, but then we're using AI and the analysis of phenotypic uh, screening images of patient tissue and feeding that data into the design process in order to give the AI design the best chance of designing the right molecule for specific patients. So let me explain a little bit how that precision medicine platform works. So just with a single patient example first. So um, this was a diffuse large B-cell lymphoma patient. Uh, he's 82 years old. Uh, he was on sixth or seventh line of treatment already. So he was very, very sick. If he didn't get the right drug, he was, he was gonna die very soon. Uh, we collect tissue. We have around about 65 study centers across Europe that we're constantly uh, collecting fresh tissue from in different cancers. Uh, and we prepare that um, and, and image it. Uh, the images are three-dimensional. This is a movie, but it's not working. Um, and the AI is able to select out via the differential staining between cancer cells, immune cells, and somatic cells. Now, this is really, really important because this is actually one of the, the, the differentiator we think in why this platform really works and has become clinically validated. Because you actually can see, is the drug only killing the cancer cells, but saving the other cells, therefore uh, not more toxic to the other cells than it is to the cancer cells? And what we can do is screen a panel of, of compounds against the patient tissue, uh, in this case, 104 uh, drugs against this single patient sample. And this whole process takes just a few days. Uh, that's in a hospital clinical setting, but actually in a lab setting for our own design, it's, it's, it's actually much quicker than a few days. 
But you can see here basically a ranking of known drugs that this patient could be given. Cisplatin comes out top, but um, basically this patient was just too weak and sick to receive cisplatin. And so he received ibrutinib uh, off-label. Um, and he had complete remission, two years survival, at a fraction of the cost of CAR-T. Now think about this in terms of a healthcare economics sense as well. Um, this guy was already on, this is like his seventh line of treatment. Why couldn't he have had the right drug selected for him in the first place? So this was the clinical trial result. So uh, on the left here, are uh, the, the patients on uh, their lack of survival in the previous lines of, uh, of, of treatment. And then there's also a non-matched group. So this is a group, a, a kind of like control group whereby the platform was suggesting which drug that they should get, but the clinicians chose to ignore that suggestion and give them what they think they should give them anyway. And you can see essentially that those non-matched and previous treatment uh, progression in, uh, in the, the, the tumors is essentially the same. It's only when patients were given the drug selected by this platform uh, that they had significant um, progression-free survival um, beyond, um, beyond the other treatments. And why is this happening? This is happening because there's huge heterogeneity in these patients. So just because somebody is, is diagnosed with a particular patient, uh, with a particular disease, a particular cancer, doesn't mean that all these patients are the same. Here uh, is a panel of 20, 20 something patients on the y-axis versus 84 drugs in this, uh, in this screening process on the, on the x-axis. The, the darker the purple, the better the effect that the drug in the, in the, um, in the x, x has. And you can see that no drug is actually treating more than about 60% of patients. In some cases, there are single patients being treated by a drug. And imagine if you were to use a cell line from that patient in a PDX model and actually design towards it, you would have ended up with only treating 5% of patients in clinical trials and fail just because you were led down the, the wrong road. So hopefully you can see a little bit about um, how we're kind of trying to change drug discovery and, and really using the, the patient to get the best drugs into the clinic using AI at multiple stages of the process. So I'm happy to take any questions as part of the panel. Thanks a lot, guys. Excellent. So thank you so much, um, Richard and the other panelists. So I'll ask um, the panelists to unmute their um, microphones and we can go into panel mode. Um, and I'll kick off um, the discussion with a question maybe to Tim um, and to Richard um, related to predictive um, safety and um, how far you think the industry is in predicting um, the safety of new molecules or uh, you know, second or third generation molecules and whether uh, and when and how regulators will accept predictive safety uh, instead of um, you know, long, expensive, and arguably unethical um, formal uh, safety and toxicology studies. Well, I, maybe I'll take a, a, a first crack at that. And Richard, I'm sure you have a lot to, to contribute. I think that this uh, idea of um, us being able to use a plethora of data now, real world evidence, um, collecting more information um, and developing better biomarkers, um, I think it's still slow. You know, there we have a long way to go um, before that's just like something we generate routinely. However, with that said, I really think, um, you know, 
in this idea of better patient selection, uh, improved diagnosis, safety signaling uh, with our real world evidence, um, and this idea of building digital twins, that once we get to that, that place where we can confidently do as much of this work in silico, I think that that's, that is kind of the future. And, and I really like what I saw where you were presenting, Richard, in terms of what you guys have achieved, um, particularly in these panels you've put together. So I, I, I think um, I think also that one of the things we're doing a lot of work in is is analyzing the data that's there. You know, using NLP and probabilistic programming, looking for signals uh, coming from the the public sphere uh, and also from the literature. I think it's going to help us definitely uh, improve our safety and efficacy and and. And even going back to that idea I had earlier, I presented earlier with the pandas and koalas, this idea of uh, real digital companions that, are, uh, that not only do we give people a drug, but we give them support that is uh, more tailored uh, to the individual. I think that's a, a, a good direction. Um, yeah, so I think the answer is kind of in, in, in two parts. So I think, um, AI and data and models are improving our ability to predict uh, toxicity and safety a lot, but we've still got some way to go. So for instance, so you saw in the, the panel data there, I didn't point it out on the slide, but there were some patients where um, actually the drug was shown to be more toxic than it was efficacious. So in actual fact, it was literally killing the, the immune cell. So these are the kinds of things we can predict. The, the AI chemistry engine has something like two and a half thousand different models, which it uses to help select compounds post-generative design. And many of those models are off targets and, and things um, around tox that we can understand, things like QT prolongation, you know, HERG, uh, uh, liver tox. But there's clearly a lot of safety signals that happen in the clinic that there isn't good data and there isn't good productivity of. And I, I don't think until we can predict that more kind of idiosyncratic tox that any regulator is going to change how we do IND enabling studies, I don't think. So Philip, can I ask something? I actually uh, think one, as a computer scientist and working for the past three years with pharma company and biotech, one of the things that is really surprising to me is that you you guys design a drug and you, you do all of this amazing work in clinical trials, but it kind of like after that you go blind. It's like, I say, okay, I want to drive from Boston to, uh, no, to California, and I know over all the roads and how they look like, but then I just, that's my plan, and I'm going to execute on it, regardless of the traffic that I'm going to see on the road was going to happen in real time. And I, I think the, the idea of companion device is kind of like, you really want to act your drug you, and, and your operation. You want to simulate how the body, particularly for diseases like uh, immune diseases, difficult diseases, complex diseases, you want something, you want the feedback. You want to regulate your drug and your doses and you, you, how you are adapting to how the patient himself is adapting. Like we know the body adapts a lot and regulate itself and compensate and there are so many things that are happening. And now you just design a drug, you design a clinical trial, you collect data, and then you put it out there without a feedback loop. And a companion uh, a, a device could help. Any feedback would be really amazing to see that, um, that uh, regulation and feedback to, to be part of the future of the design both for safety and efficacy. Yeah, that's a great point, Dina. Uh, and we, we try also through um, picking up safety signals from patients that are using our drugs. I think that's the coarsest form right now, but I think, yeah, if we had real feedback from 
how people were reacting and having that re kind of training the models uh, that would be op that would be really terrific yeah i i will say that um uh you know the closest that the industry has got to this um is with insulin pumps and real-time glucose monitoring um you know which is the probably the simplest um system you know being a system that was discovered 100 years ago this year um but i think there's an awful lot of opportunity um in tailoring dosing in particular um you know most medicines fail um really not through through safety but through inappropriate uh and uncompliant dosing so uh there's a lot of interest in you know, ways in which dosing can be monitored, improved. Um, our own uh, self-administration devices are Bluetooth enabled, so the physician knows if the patient has at least taken the medicine. Um, and then it's a small step then to have, um, uh, you know, applications that, that monitor, um, you know, potential adverse events. Um, one question uh, that came up a couple of times in the chat, and I want to thank um the participants for for bringing this up because it's it's come up a number of times previously uh, and perhaps you know I'll, I'll send this to dina and christian um as we collect passive uh as we passively collect um lots of data from patients particularly around behaviors um you know their speech what they're saying who they're speaking to um uh how how do you deal with privacy concerns that is that you learn you know more about the patient um than perhaps you really you know should or or want to um how do you protect the data um you know how do you make sure that that um it's you know it's interpreted correctly uh, christian do you want to start and then i'll well, it's going to be very quick on my side, uh, so it's less fine grained than what uh, Dina is uh, is manipulating. In our case, we only deal with de-identified data, and we are looking and exploring other strategies to try to make our prediction, but based on encrypted data, so without decrypting the data uh, at any time in the process, uh, which would actually preserve the privacy of the data and the contributor of that data. So that's maybe one angle to, to solve that. Um, the rest is trying to manipulate that data in a de-identified way if it's not necessary and uh, um, making sure that we put the right guardrails around that data so that uh, only the people that are supposed to look at that data do actually have access to it. So uh, I can tell you about our approach and it has multiple uh, axes. So the first one, of course, I mean, uh, IOB and informed consent. I mean, basically, whatever data we collect and analyze is according to the protocol and the patient is informed exactly what is measured and uh, they consent to it. And the data is used only in that way. The second thing is that one of the nice thing about the way we operate the machine learning is that you have wireless signal, but you have different machine learning module. So let's say that I am engaged in a clinical study about sleep, and I don't have to generate any data related to motion or when a person, how the person is moving or where they are and when they are entering the bathroom or anything like that. It becomes only just sleep because that machine learning module that is activated is only generating the sleep hypnogram. So, so basically, you, you separate and you collect and analyze only the data that is needed in accordance with the protocol. The third thing, of course, is uh, technology that helps with privacy and security. So everything is Basically, we never in our system collect any PHI or PIIs. There is nothing that is related to any personal information. It's completely de-identified on our side. And only the site has the information to reconnect those completely coded and patient. And once the study is done, we even like remove the, the, the connection between the, the data and how you map them back to the original patient. Finally, there are technological things that uh, also we have technology that 
make sure that the data focuses only in an area in space that has the participants and does not collect uh, both for, for uh, privacy and also for accuracy, just focuses on the voxel of space where the signal comes from the participants. So a long <laughs> answer, but security and privacy, of course, is very, very important and we have to take them very seriously. Yes, and, and maybe, you know, a, a kind of general question for, for the panelists, um, you know, related to federated learning. Uh, this was a topic um, in, in one of our very first webinars um, where, you know, particularly hospital settings, um, data tends to live and stay in the place that it's generated. Um, and so aggregating large data sets um, you know, which are sometimes, as Christian requires, you know, said, required to kind of validate um, patient stratification or, uh, you know, uh, efficacy models. Um, I'd be interested to, to know how the panelists think about um, deploying federated uh, machine learning. I can talk about it a bit from the technology perspective, and then I'll let the rest of the panelists cover other aspects as well. So uh, as a person who works and develops uh, neural network models, I think there are two issues. One is feder federated uh, learning has advanced drastically and you can do a lot with it. The caveat, however, and the trick is whether the data is intrinsically different. And let me give you just an example so uh, you understand what I'm saying. So for example, we, we, we work with multiple hospitals and we like as one of the things that we look at is like you can take from the sleep labs in different hospitals and even public data set you can take EEG signals and you can ask yourself can I identify from this EEG signal uh, certain diseases like Parkinson let's say or Alzheimer or whatever you, you're so now you have to be careful because basically while it is always EEG signal but different uh, hospitals position the electrodes slightly differently, have slightly different system, store their data in different format, EDF dot versus dot mat. And all of that thing makes that data in these different places slightly different. So let's say that I'm working with two hospitals, hospital one and hospital two. Hospital one has way more Parkinson patients than hospital two. And now I treat them as if they are just taking the same data set and federate, doing federated learning over all of these institutions. Now the model can get confused without additional information and may think that Parkinson is associated with an institution or a data set. So, so when you do federated learning, there are many technologies, but also you have to be very, very careful that you need to understand all of the data and the differences between those data sets and being able to design your models to, to take that into account and in incorporating that, uh, that information in the federated uh, learning technology. Yeah, that's something we really push our teams on uh, as well, you know, with that idea of robustness in a sense, like you know, as the models evolve and as the data sources change, you know, really challenging them to make sure that, that what you started with is still germane. It's, it, I think it's a, it's a challenge, but it has to be built into the design. I, was, I have a question for Richard. Like, I like that panel a lot you had with the 80 different drugs um, and the different patients. Do you see that as like, perhaps like a tool for drug combos? you know, that you could try to think of combination therapies that the different uh, clinicians could recommend? Uh, and is it dependent, does it have to use uh, always live tissue? Um, okay, so in theory, yes, we can we can use it uh, to, to test drug combos. Obviously, you, the, the number of combinations that you could test in a sample we can you know 80 to 120 something like that for a single sample yes so you could do that uh, I think we have done some uh, studies a, a bit like that 
Um, sorry, what was the second question? Oh, it's just, would that be uh, something almost like a clinical tool then that could be uh, deployed or almost as a product? I'm, I'm just curious because it's like, I immediately look at that and I think, okay, you know, you can see toxicity, drug combos um, as a potential of, of taking drugs that we already have, you know, in many cases, cheap drugs that are off patent and be able to get the same effect. Uh, yeah, so I mean, and and you know, Dina was talking about how do you how do you really make sure that you're giving the right drug to the right patient, and and yeah, we I'm not quite sure how much I should say. We, we obviously the the tool has incredible power, not just in designing drugs for us, but like you say, selecting the right drugs for the right patient in in any setting, um, and so. Yeah, we we'll, we are investigating how how we can um, best deploy that. Because mm -hmm. a lot of big pharma, you know, have committed to not only collecting tissue but sequencing it. So there's yeah, that and we've, element and we've to shown well. some, you know, we've shown that in many cases genetic biomarkers are just not good enough. They just don't select properly. Um, that in fact the heterogeneity of of tumors and and cells is is greater than you can pull out uh, with with genes alone. Now you can use lots of other analysis to work your way back. So you know we're looking at some of those effects and saying what's the molecular the underlying molecular mechanism. And indeed, when you use things like transcriptomics and proteomics, you can you can then connect the circle back to new drug discovery programs to understand why things are happening, not just, just what. So as we're on this kind of interesting topic, um, you know, about, you know, clinical tools, um, one question that was kind of, you know, came up in the pre-submitted um, was how do we help um, clinicians trust uh, these tools that are based in deep learning and artificial intelligence, where, as Christian said, they may not be entirely explainable. Maybe I'll ask Christian to 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 uh, expand on that. Yeah, I mean, the first thing is probably to uh, do as extensive validation as possible. Um, we are stuck with the current data that we have or have been collecting in the past. Uh, that said, we can do a fairly good approximation or a good job of evaluating these models in these types of contexts, either from past clinical trials or large initiatives that have been collecting data for multiple years. Uh, after that, the real test will be uh, in the wild or um, once they are deployed uh, in the clinic. Um, the other point that you were making regarding uh, interpretability. So what we are doing so far, I mean, obviously there is limitation in terms of the, ex the exact ex explanation of the models. And as you go into more complex predictive models or deep learning models, you run into that issue of the black box. Um, one thing to, that you can do is to... Uh, Considered the black box, not necessarily exactly what was interpreted, but there is ways to analyze the black box uh, externally and its behavior and uh, pinpoint what are the features that were the inputs basically of the model. And uh, for an, a specific individuals, which features and the specific parameters that weighted towards the final decision or the final recommendation. That can be a very interesting tool to try to explain a little bit, go beyond just the recommendation or the prediction and try to give a bit more depth uh, in that explanation that can reaffirm the, the, the confidence of the clinician towards that prediction, if it do aligns with what they believe or their feeling of um, that the marker do align with the, the prediction. Can I add a bit to that? I think it's a, like we tend to talk about AI as a black box and not understandable, but actually there is a lot of nuance there. So it's really a wide spectrum. So let me give you one thing that I was talking, for example, about extracting data from wireless signals and the motion. I mean, it's 
quite explainable. I mean, basically, it's actually more explainable than the MDS to PDRS is the actual clinical measure. You are seeing that person, you see how the person moves, and you see that the model gives you how the person moves. So as opposed to the MDS to PDRS, where you go tell the patient your MDS to PDRS has increased by I don't know, 15 points, that's a lot, but it's the patient. So what does that mean? So, so, so I think there is a spectrum. Now, let's, let me go to the other side of the spectrum where you really can't understand, like and take an EEG signal and predict from it, or actually even recently we have shown that we can take respiratory signal, nocturnal respiration, and can tell you whether somebody has Parkinson's or not. So that's, uh, it's really hard to explain what exactly the manifold or like how the AI system analyzes the respiration signal to get from that information related to Parkinson's. But then you can start treating it exactly like you guys treat your drugs. There are many cases where you don't understand exactly the mechanism of actions, but we have a randomized control study that we can analyze those things that we don't completely understand and statistically have confidence about their performance and try to explain them using like what Christian was saying, external tools by aligning them, for example. I can tell you that the signal that the AI model focuses on this piece of signal, which happens during like the onset of sleep where there is a lot of medical literature that shows that Parkinson patients are different from control in that, in that case. But at the end of the day, we have drugs that we don't know exactly the mechanism of action. And you guys have developed amazing tools to take those drugs to, to patients. And that actually, I think a technology where we can try to at least create confidence around the AI method in the same way using randomized controlled studies. Adding to that, one of the things that we've built in for our Panda model is a dashboard that's really easy to use for clinicians that they can actually manipulate the major variables uh, in the models and see how it affects the individual patients. So it, it, it takes the model and it's not something that is just monolithic, they get an answer, but they can move the levers and see how it's working. So it actually gets them more confident uh, in the model as well, kind of putting them in the loop. And I think that's another thing that we sh I should try to do kind of more often as we deploy these. Yeah, there are many mechanisms. I mean, like, we mm -hmm. should not just think of it as completely black box. It's, it's mm -hmm. gray with different level of grays, depending on where you are and what you want to do with it. I just want also to emphasize one thing, which is that we tend to force a model or we always we might think that we want just models that are explainable and interpretable. But sometimes if, if we limit ourselves to this, then we cannot advance medicine because basically we are only going to have the machine do what we know how to do and what we know already. We cannot discover new things, but actually the, the machine can discover a new pattern and new things that currently doctors don't know. And if we just put as a, our upper bound, it thinks that we can interpret then we just limit our opportunities. I think we, we should always try to have interpretable, explainable models, but we should be open to when there are interesting results that are statistically significant, that similarly to how you treat your drugs, we are open to say, okay, so medicine can actually advance using machine learning. Okay, hey, and so, we're going to close up the panel and I'm going to ask each of the um, panelists um, to answer what I think was, you know, one of the most popular questions, um, which really is what is the biggest challenge <clears throat> to uh, general adoption of um, artificial intelligence and deeper machine learning in translational research? And so maybe I'll start out with um, Richard and then Tim um Dina and then we'll finish up with Christian so the biggest challenge that you see um to to generalize the adoption so obviously the biggest challenge is really having the right data but I think as an industry we also have another challenge and that's just literally the processes and the infrastructure that we have in place so 
you know, pharma industry has been around for a hundred years and we've had processes and ways of doing things. And if we're going to properly adopt AI, a bit like what Dina was just saying, we need to be able to accept that it has the ability to do things that as humans, we actually can't do and we can't think through. And we need to be able to, to trust it and actually re-engineer the entire process to fit with how AI works. And don't imagine that somehow the role of AI is to reteach humans how to do something. It's, it's not. Okay. Tim. That was, yeah, that was, that was a great point because I was going to start off with the data piece as well. But it, I, I think from what I've observed too is, is that there's a, a small group of, of early adopters, you know, they're those people that are, are just always ready for the new thing. And that really there's a giant group of people who are waiting to see something successful. And then they'll, 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 they'll join in. And I think that that is kind of part of human behavior. And so I think part of our work at AIML is, is not only getting the successes, but how do we how do we display and share those successes so that it becomes something that people are those that second group is willing to say, okay, I'm ready to, to try this out. Excellent. Um, Dina. So I would say the, the biggest challenge is the status quo. I was recently at a, uh, a summit, a leadership summit for a uh, pharma actually with Dave Lees and a uh, and few others. And one of the things that shocked me is one of the speaker was showing a slide with innovation, technological innovation that got adopted by pharma and biotech. And like from something as simple as electronic PROs, like you just obvious, like electronic PROs, what, like, what to think about not to adopt uh, more than 30 years and still not fully adopted. So I think it's just um, there is a status quo, there is the procedures, the, the, the what people, it's always much easier to fail in the standard way than to fail in a new way and much more justifiable to fail like everyone else, but failing on new things is dangerous and nobody wants to do that. So I would say it's really pharma being more, um, more open to technology and being able to take that step and understand that, yeah, there is risk that comes with it, but you can isolate that risk and control it. And then the last word from Christian. Yeah, I think you, you made a, a great point, Dinah. Um, I would second that actually, the building trust with pharma and like they are super risk averse and uh, trying to de-risk the use of AI in their current pipeline to minimize friction is very important. Uh, they are interested by uh, these AI models, but they are not necessarily, they will stick still to the same uh, old ways that they were doing. And I think there is ways to integrate these strategies without increasing their risk. Um, and I think this is where we, we, we should go uh, and, and try to as much as possible uh, um, supplement what is currently done uh, uh, with AI, uh, trying to put our best foot forward to, to maximize our chances of success in bringing these drugs uh, uh, in the market and in the ends of patients. Okay, excellent. And so with that, um, I'd like to again thank the panelists, um, thank the uh, fantastic technical support team at Altitude, uh, thank the sponsorship from uh, 60DM and Jesse, um, and, you know, close this session. The, uh, the recording will be available on the 60DM website. And apologies to those of you uh, who didn't have your specific questions answered. Um, please reach out to the panelists through LinkedIn chat, uh, and I'm sure they'll be willing uh, to answer, you know, those specific questions and uh, engage in a dialogue, um, which is the purpose of this meeting. So, again, thank you all for participating, uh, and uh, have an excellent morning, afternoon, and evening, depending upon where you are in the world. Uh, merci, uh, au revoir.
Merci Thank beaucoup. You. Thank Good you to see everyone. Thank you to you, Philip. Bye.